Hi everybody, uh, welcome to a slightly cooler KW lug than it would have been if we had it last week. Uh, but still nice and hot, so I appreciate you all came out of your probably air-conditioned houses to our slightly less air-conditioned space. Uh, so I don't have much to say. I think we've got meetings lined up, meetings lined up for most of the future. Uh, I didn't have a chance to check what we're still looking for, uh, so I might pick Paul's brain to see if we need space for anything. There's one slot that's coming up where we need a beginner friendly presentation. Um, I think, I don't remember, I don't think it's next month, it may be September that we need something. So if you would like to offer something that's beginner friendly, um, then you can speak to me or Andrew or you can just send email to us. Does anybody have anything offhand that they would be interested in presenting? Or anything you'd like to see. Or anything that you'd like to see. Have you ever done anything on spyware? Somebody can just stick on your computer. Spyware? Yeah. Spyware in a Linux context or spyware just overall? Uh, I guess on a it would be on a Linux machine. Yeah. yeah. Question yeah. Do you want to run spyware or do you want to see it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see if somebody's doing it. I, the no, one thing I'm thinking it might be a hard talk to give like, because I suspect very little of it's open source. <laughs> well, there's, no, there's actually there's someone I can talk to. There is open source spyware. Um, not open source you know, spyware. Uh, unreputable. <laughs> On the theme, someone who worked for a company that was bought by Cisco, and now I can't remember the name of the product, but I think it's um, it's something that scans for malware and spyware and those kinds of things, and I believe it's they they publish the signatures or something. Is it Sam? No, no, no. <laughs> somebody was bought by Cisco. And they were, I think they were here, and it's either, they had a small office here, but they were also a relatively small company. Blue Coat? No, <laughs> smaller than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, I will, I will follow up. I think I, I sent them an email, and I didn't follow up with them. So I'll see, I'll see if I can find them and see if they'd be interested. Well, what is more, the KW Log website says that on the uh, November meeting, Mark Stepp is doing something on detecting There's more chairs, too. Websites. Uh, there's more chairs as well. So there's like that room on there. And I mean, that'll be kind of similar. Uh, all right, so along those lines, if you if come September. up with, oh, for September? Yeah, September we need another talk. That okay. we can November also. Hmm? November also. In the oh, another beginner talk. Yeah. Oh, okay, so if, if someone, well, let's see if we can find a beginner like, security talk. And do encrypt, or let's encrypt again. So, if you come up with an idea or you come up with something you want, feel free to uh, drop a message on the mailing list. Uh, the meeting, um, the uh, attendance sheet will go around. If you're not on the mailing list, just check it off with your email address and we'll be happy to add you. Uh, all right, so this is still a new space. The bathrooms are that way. Uh, the kitchen is open for us to get water, but nothing else. We are generally kind of supposed to stay in the middle. Um, all the desks and things are off limits, so it's just for the people who are here. But we're probably all just going to sit anyway. Uh, Tim is going to be giving us the first presentation about the sprinkler system. This is going to be strange. He's not going to talk about containers, so far as I know. <laughs> so for anybody who's been here before, that might be weird. But I think it'll be okay. <laughs> And then after then, Benjamin's going to give his uh, first talk to us to talk about CubeOS, which, if I understand correctly, is a container-based operating system that gives better security. So it's still containers. V Excellent. VMs. 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 Ah, different types of containers. Pretty much. Fancy containers. <laughs> All right. So I think that's it. Uh, oh, I'll give one. One for Paul, two things. One for me. One for me. So first of all, this space, for anybody who's not familiar, um, it's the KW Innovation Center. It's a co-working space. So the intention is that, I think part of the reason we're allowed to present here is because we're supposed to say, hey, this is an amazing space. And if you're looking for a co-working space or you have some tiny startup or something that's looking for working space, then you can come in here and there's two trays there. 
Yeah, man, congrats. Um, the first thing, and then I think the second thing is that Bob Johnson is running Systems Administration. Systems this Administration Day? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, last Friday and every July is the Systems Administrator Appreciation Day, when systems administrators get gifted with chocolate cake and ice cream. Except in my experience, that has never, ever happened. I've been doing this for 30 years, and I have had 30 years of milk chocolate cake and ice cream. Have you tried asking for a raise instead? <laughs> well, that doesn't work so much. Uh, <laughs> instead of chocolate cake and ice cream, um, I invite all the systems administrators and system administrator wannabes and system administrator spouses and friends and relations to come out to Systems Administrator Day dinner, which we're holding at Abe Herb here in Kitchener um, at the tannery on uh, Friday, the uh, 27th of uh, July, uh, starting at about 6 o'clock and going until the beer run. <laughs> Huckerness is after Huckerness starts at eight. If you want some cake or something, Sorry. Huckerness. Huckerness. Yeah. Tonight, actually. Tonight. Because sometimes. So we could go raid Hacker's Nest and then come right back. Uh, what else? Was, there was something else I was going to say. I forgot. Oh, all right. Uh, the one selfish thing I had was uh, KW Ruby is next week. Colin's going to be presenting on GitLab. Uh, then we're going to try doing a workshop a week afterwards. So we're all going to try uh, going out to Settlement Co. Coffee Shop and actually play with GitLab. Um, so like, try to get a building. When is this? Whatever. So um, this will be the Tuesday afterwards. Okay. So we'll see how it works. Um, someone suggested that we're going to do it a month after. Um, but someone suggested that that might be too long and a week, week might be good, but then we're also going to do it a month after because <laughs> we can't get enough workshops. So if you've got any interest in uh, using GitLab, come and have, uh, listen to Colin. Uh, Colin will also be presenting here in September. Pretty much the same, but a more truncated version. Okay. So if you, if you miss it, you can come and work on GitLab on two different dates, check out KW Ruby, or you can just keep coming here and mm -hmm. you'll get so, more GitLab eventually. So long as I, I don't get hit by a bus between <laughs> the first talk and the second talk, you can get it. <laughs> so you're saying we should record the first one just in just case? Just in case, right? It's like eating dessert first. <laughs> you never know if you're going to choke to death on the dinner. Uh, so then the last thing <laughs> is, uh, Bob mentioned Abe Herb, that afterwards a bunch of us would usually go out for drinks and dinner uh, over to Abe Herb, so it's just the walk south of here to go over to the tannery building where Google used to be um, and go there. So after all the talks are done, you can just follow whichever crowd of people want and go in that direction. It will be easy to find. All right. Oh, one more thing. One more, one more thing. Sorry. Um, remember, next month we're not here. Uh, yes. Next month we're closer to Aver. We're going to be in the new Google building community mm. space for next month and then the month after in September, we'll be back here. So keep an eye on the website and in meeting announcements to know which building to go to so you don't go to the wrong building. So I guess this also, if anybody has uh, objections or if anybody really likes this space or anybody really doesn't like this space, um, you can mention, we would appreciate feedback on the mailing list. Um, I think this is tentatively a new home, it seems to work okay, seems to have been a pretty good space, it's a lot quieter than um, St. John's Kitchen. Um, everybody seems to have found it so far, even though that direction's a little bit scary. Um, but yeah, um, so I think tent tentatively, unless Google is incredibly awesome, but I think they don't want to commit to hosting us every single month necessarily, so we will see. All right, I think that's it for me, and now I'll actually give space to Tim. Well, about Thank you very much. Good morning. I am speaking English today, and so I might trip up a little bit along the way. My apologies. Um, another thing is that uh, when I bought a house, or when my wife and I bought a house eight years ago, I wasn't planning on giving this talk. So um, some of the photos are after the fact rather than before the fact. You'll notice the plants and the greenery and Everything looks remarkably similar, though I'm talking about a long period of time. Um, yes, I cheated. Um, so with all of that, um, let's get started. We have a house. We've got a front yard, and there's lots of green stuff there. There's some pots. There's some pots you can't see. 
we've got a back porch, or a second floor rather, and um, we've got 10 of these pots. Uh, the second floor of our house is above the trees. Our yard has a lot of trees in it, and so this is where we get the most sunlight. So we grow the tomatoes on the second floor. Um, so we have 10 of these pots on the second floor. We've got plants. Uh, my wife uh, likes not to get eaten by the mosquitoes, which means hanging out outside is best done in the morning. And this is a nice viewpoint to look at it. Uh, lots of flowers, uh, always in bloom. Um, and you can see we've got a lot of pots here. Nearby, on the other side of that fence, um, there's a garden that we put in. And then there is an herb garden that actually when we moved in, there was already a little bit of an herb garden there. So we've got a lot of green stuff that needs to be watered. Um, so um, to, for the purpose of this talk, what I'm going to do is take you through the journey of how I ended up on Linux doing the watering for me. Now, it didn't start out with Linux, um, but I think that a lot of these foundational bits, if you're interested in tackling this project on your own, um, it are going to be really, really helpful, uh, because the Linux really is, is the simplest part of the overall ecosystem. A lot of the hard problems had already been solved by the time I got there. Um, and so, uh, let's start in 2010. And we bought a house. Yeah, we bought a house. <laughs> so, um, what does that mean? Uh, we got to buy a bunch of tools. Um, so, I got, I got my first big collection of power tools and all sorts of random stuff for removing paint and drywall. Okay, so it's not as exciting as it sounds. But, um, but needless to say, that was pretty much what we were doing in 2010, was kind of making a home. Um, and then, uh, in, you know, uh, actually, uh, you can see this is the home. There's the ridge line of our house. Um, that's the original house. This is this area here is an addition that they added to the back of the house, so it's just a single room. There's a crawl space underneath it, and there's a, a deck on the second floor, so those tomatoes are growing kind of right there. There's the car in the driveway, so this is the street up here. Neighbors, neighbors, and backyard, and there's a garden, the back porch, the herb garden. So you have a sense of the space, but this is a lot easier to read. So this is kind of what our house looks like. And what I'm gonna do is, at the end of every year, I'm gonna show you Beginning of the year, end of the year, what changed? Um, so 2010, we started out with not much. I mean, there were some things, you know, there were some plants up here, and there's some plants back there. And I don't remember exactly, we probably had a couple potted plants, but I don't remember where they were. So 2011, uh, we wanted to use more rainwater um, to do our water. And, and a lot of this talk is really gonna be talking about my journey through making rainwater usable by Linux. Um, so we bought a rain barrel. Um, the city sells these. Uh, who here has bought a rain barrel from the city? Yep. Yeah. So 40 bucks, I think, is how much I paid. Is that? Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. Uh, so we got a rain barrel. And we got another one for free. One of our friends, just for whatever reason, they didn't ha need their rain barrel. I, I couldn't understand how that would happen, but they didn't need it. So we took it. Um, and um, now the question is, I have these two rain barrels, where do I put them? And so, um, you know, what, uh, what I decided was to put them there. And the reason why is all the doors are over here. So if I put the rain barrel, and then there's a downspout about right there, there's a downspout right about here, and then there's two downspouts that come down right there. And so the nice thing is it's not in where I'm gonna walk, or sorry, where I'm gonna walk and drive, because I can't, I couldn't put a rain barrel there because I hit it. It's not here in the front yard, so it's back here, and, and by the way, this is kind of the moldy, you, we all have a house, side of the house that doesn't get that sun, you know, it's, it's always a little damp, and, and you know, and think, you, know, you put your shade tolerant plants over there, that's that side of the house. We don't really see it, we don't walk in it, and it doesn't get any sun. So it was the perfect place to put the rain barrels because we, we could get the rain from kind of this part of the house, plus the entire second floor deck drains right there. So I put the rain barrels right there. I was able to collect both of those downspouts and get water. And then you remember how I said that our addition has a crawl space? So I was able to run a hose underneath and there's a spot right here where I could, I could daylight it so we could, uh, we could use that water. And so here's kind of a picture. Um, I put the rain barrels up on a large stand, 
Um, and that was, my thought was, well, you know, you can't fill a bucket or anything with a rain barrel that's on the ground. So lift it up in the air, and if I, can, if I could lift it one foot in the air, why not five feet or six feet so I could get a little bit of pressure on it? So that's what I did. I did a big, tall stand. You can see here I have a hose, and it's coming out of this one, and then it's just a T-junction right here, and it comes out and, and goes and, and trails off. So they, they were hooked up to each other, and, and, and I just put water in one, and it would go back through the hose and up and fill up that other tank. So I didn't, I didn't have to worry about um, putting water in both of them. Um, and so here's kind of a picture of that hose, and it goes underneath the, the addition of the house. And we have this kind of door area, so this part, you can just see the edge of the house right there. And then this is our back deck. And so these doors go to the underside of our deck. And let's see if I can make this brighter, because I can't see it. Um, but <laughs> there are two arrows here. There's a faucet here, and that's the faucet that came with the house. Um, so it's, you know, it runs city water. Um, and then there's another faucet right here. And what I did was I installed a second faucet. Um, and that faucet was connected to the rain barrels. So when I opened that faucet, it drew off the rain barrels. And I got a little kind of short uh, washer dryer hose that uh, threaded on there. And that allowed me to you know, fill up um, watering cans uh, pretty easily. Um, so the problem was we ran out of water. Uh, it was 2011. There was about a month of drought during that year, a little more than that. It was really dry. Hey, let's see if you guys. Yeah, it's about the, as good as it's going to get, unfortunately. The, the windows. Yeah. Um, but so we ran out of water. And, and I, was, I was very upset by that. Um, so beginning of the year, at the end of the year, you can see the change, added some barrels, and these are kind of pots that we were watering. So we added a bunch of potted plants, and then I actually, it kind of looked like digging a grave. I dug a shallow grave in the backyard and filled it with uh, good soil to, uh, to plant a garden in. Mm -hmm. So we, we added a garden right here, because this is kind of the brightest spot. And you can see right there, this little red thing, that's kind of the faucet. It's peeking out because it's underneath the deck, right? It's not on top of it or something like that. Um, this is all three-dimensional. Okay, so my goal for 2012 was to get more water. Um, so I got more rain barrels. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit ambitious, but there are five additional rain barrels in the system, so now we have seven barrels. Um, and I, I hope that that might allow us to not run out of water, and I am glad to report we don't. <laughs> um, it works great. And how I've got it all hooked up is it's, it's common unit command, cap all the barrels and pipe them to my garden hose. <laughs> so I've got, this is that solo that you see right here. That's coming from those original two rain barrels, so I just added a cap. And I've got this in kind of a bus, right? And, and, and each barrel's coming down into that. It's got a little bit of a slant to it. And then there's a little garden hose connector here, and that goes off to the old faucet. So I've got, I've got seven rain barrels, and they go out through one hose. I pour water into this barrel, and it kind of backtracks its way through here and fills all of them. Where did I get them? I got them at Brubacher Drums. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, cheap, I think they're 20 bucks each, um, so a lot cheaper than what the city offers. Um, but um, the question is how to hook them up. So who here has done a rain barrel before? Yeah, have you drilled the hole? No. Now who has drilled the hole in the rain barrel before? Okay, and let well, me guess, yeah, yeah. you have, you at the bottom, right? Uh, actually, I put them at the top so I could join the overflow. Ah, but how'd you get the water out? Uh, it came with uh, spouts, spouts in the bottom. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you get like a regular barrel, you know, the idea is, is you put a hole right there. And then you have a long arm, you reach down, and you get like this compression fitting with a gasket on it. And it and again outputs spout and spigot. Uh, and that's how you get your water out of the rain barrel. Unless you buy a purposely built rain barrel with that kind of pre-installed. And um, that's kind of tricky. You have to buy these parts, you have to attach them, and then that has to be a watertight fitting because it's below the water. So um, if there's any leaks in it, they're going to leak forever. 
right, until the barrel's dry. But on these barrels, um, oh, by the way, and let me talk, um, those barrels that they sell, they're kind of, um, they're surplus barrels. Um, they're things like, uh, several of the barrels held olive oil. Mm -hmm. I think two of them held like the soap, the use of car wash. So you, know, you rinse them out, and you had to, I had this greasy, soapy water in the driveway for a little while. But, uh, but otherwise, they were fine. But, um, but these barrels have these, these bung holes in the top, and that's what those are called. Um, and uh, these, this is the cap that goes in the bung hole. It's a two-inch diameter cap. But what's interesting is the center of these caps has a threaded insert. And some of them, you can remove it. It's got a little removable cap. But most of them, you just drill out that center. And the cool thing is, this is a three-quarter inch FIP, a female or, uh, iron pipe connection. This is a standard connection. You can go to the hardware store. You can buy these very easily. Um, so what it meant was I could use bog standard connections, industry established specs, and just screw it together. And these connections are made to be watertight. They were designed from day one to be watertight. This is how your water gets to you, how your gas gets to you. So these are rock solid connections. So what I did was I installed all these barrels upside down. And I screwed that pipe in and now the best connection I had was on the bottom. And it was, and it was nice and tight and I, 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 I glued up all the piping you saw and, and it didn't leak, it's perfect. And then what I did, you can't, you can't put water into a barrel that doesn't have um, an exchange point, an air point. That's probably part of the reason why there are two caps on these. And so I just drilled a hole in, quote, the bottom, but now the top of the barrels. And that allows the air to equalize in those barrels. Can I ask a question? Oh, yeah. How did you, uh, isn't that the lid as well at the top? How did you make that water tank the lid? So this is actually permanently, like this was manufactured sealed. Okay. So the only this was designed for liquid contents, and so there's a draw draw caps, but that's it. So yeah, not everybody will be so lucky, um, but if you can find these, they're very easy to work with because they've got these threaded connections. So this is a better option. This is you've probably seen some of these. These are 250 gallons, um, pardon the imperial units, and I think the other barrels are about 55 each. Um, so it actually been a lot cheaper to go with this. And what these have is they have a draw off on the bottom. It's actually a valve. Um, like it, they come built with a valve with a standardized connection that you can, you can thread things into and so forth. So it's very easy to make the connection on the bottom of them. You have no concerns. And then you just take the cap off and you put your, um, your downspout into the hole. And boom, you've got a rain barrel. Um, super simple. So put it up on a stand, put the downspout into it. You've got, a, you've got a complete system. The re uh, I don't know, but I think they were like 60 or 80 or something. They were significantly less for my system to buy. But the problem is, is these come in one size, and that size is larger than my property one. Um, so if I put it against the house, it would stick about a foot and a half into the neighbor. And I didn't want to have that discussion, so I went with a bunch of barrels. But if you can do this, this will save you a lot of plumbing fixtures. But it, it will also be heavier, much heavier. To move? I mean, well, whatever it's, it's, it's sitting on has to be very sturdy because, you know, 250 gallons is very... But it's no heavier than my other setup, because I have five But the other is kind of... Drums. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's, it, it's not actually terribly hard. Um, for my stand, I used uh, four by tens, I believe it was, and I, I have four of them running lengthwise. They still sag a little bit, and so I actually have a middle support because... Um, was it's probably eight feet long and over eight feet they do sag enough that the middle barrel becomes the low point in the system mm. uh, so I have a little bit of a prop on them but uh, it's not too hard to do think about your house um, it's 250 gallons times eight it's about 2,000 pounds and we have plausibly that much furniture in a room at times um, so it's not, uh, or people, like you have a party, you can have 10 people standing in the space wishing you a happy birthday, that's 2,000 pounds. Um, or at least my people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 2012, um, we found ourselves carrying water around a lot. Um, we had to fill up the watering buckets. This isn't one of ours, but you know, representative sample. We had two of them actually, but it would take about a minute to fill up each from this hose. And we needed about 15, 10, 15 buckets of water 
uh, for watering. Like it, you know, and we have to fill up the bucket, walk around the front of the house, dump the buckets, come back, fill them up, walk around to the front again, dump a couple more buckets, fill them up, go into the house, upstairs, out the second floor deck, water the tomatoes, come downstairs, and then do the same thing for the backyard and all the potted plants. And this took a while. It took almost a half an hour, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, it was a lot of water. So again, end of the year. So the difference, more rain barrels. Um, so 2013, I added a pump. And if you take nothing from this talk, buy a pump. Um, this is the most important part of the entire system. I will take a pump and you can burn everything else. If the house is on fire, I grab my laptop and then I grab this pump. Okay, maybe not. I'll use it to pump the water into the house, but that's a different story. Logical. Um, so, um, what is so awesome about the pump? Uh, well, if you have a pump, you can pump water uphill. You have plenty of pressure. When I use using the hose to fill those buckets, it kind of, you know, it would come out. But like, if I hooked it up to a garden hose, it would just kind of dribble on, you know, I mean, it would come out, but it would just go straight down, right? And I couldn't spray, I couldn't do anything particularly useful with it. I could fill buckets, but after that, um, there was really no efficient way of moving the water around. You need some pressure to get the water to move at a, at a rate that's usable. Uh, you know, if we just stretch the hose to the front of the house, yeah, water would technically come out, but it'd be very slow, and there were only some parts of the front of the house we'd be able to get to. So with this pump, um, this is a um, this is what's called a RV park pump or a mobile home park pump. So if you are in an RV, um, if you go and you turn on the faucet, water comes out. That's not surprising. But the reason why the water comes out, it's not because there's a huge tank on the roof that would make it kind of an awkward vehicle. Um, the tank's still in the bottom, but what they have is a pump that looks like this. And what it has is a little pressure switch right here, and it detects a pressure drop on the output side. And when it detects it, it turns on the pump, and it pumps up until it hits pressure. And then it turns off. So as you, if you close the faucet, you'll hear this go, and then cut off, because it's reached pressure. And it works beautifully. These pumps are really nice. The one I have, um, it can, it, you don't run it dry. But we have run it dry a couple times when we we're getting the system set up, when we had leaks and things like that. And it ran for eight hours straight dry. And yeah, the motor was hot, but the pump was perfectly fine. The, the, the mechanism it uses, uh, it's a diaphragm pump. So it's, it, it's quite robust against uh, contamination, against uh, wear and tear. Um, it really is a phenomenal design. It puts out plenty of pressure for what we need to do. No, this is not, you know, this will not strip paint off your car, but, um, but you can run a sprinkler off of it and you can get a good portion of your yard off this pump. Um, so uh, it took me an embarrassingly long period of time to figure out, add a shutoff valve. This is where the rain barrels come in. Add a shutoff valve. Um, because you're gonna have to do stuff on the pump and the water lines, and it's really hard if you can't turn the water off. <laughs> Um, the next thing is, this is a filter. Don't buy these without a filter. Um, get a little filter. Um, this catches like all the gravel from the roof and the little leaf litter and things like that that gather. And I have to clean this out. I just cleaned it out last weekend. I have to clean it out every month or so. Uh, it needs pretty frequent cleaning because it is a small filter. And then I actually have another filter over here I just added this year. That's for the very fine sediment to keep from clogging up the sprinklers, which I eventually installed. Um, so um, the other thing to note is that um, this bucket, uh, this blue thing, that is just a, a tote, like a, a cheap, probably the cheapest tote I could find. And it's underneath the rain barrels, it's actually screwed in underneath, upside down. And then the pump's sitting in there, and so it just sheds all the water. Nothing gets in there, it stays bone dry, but it's easy to get at those things. And if I have any leaks or drips on the pump, it just falls to the ground underneath the, uh, the rain barrels. So you can see kind of the corner of the rain barrel stand, and you can see that there's some screws and it's screwed right into the corners there. Um, the last thing is this is plugged into a GFI outlet, a ground fault interrupting outlet. Um, and that will save your life. Don't use these without GFI outlets. You're dealing with water, and you're dealing with electricity. Um, 
but I just want to make sure that's absolutely clear. Ground this thing, hook it up to a GFI. I have had the GFI go off on this thing before. I had a, uh, I, I have a float switch which I installed on the unit, which detects when the barrels are running dry and, and kills the power of the pump. There was a an electrical short in that float switch that actually, uh, not reliably, but every couple days we took the GFI. So I've now ordered a new float switch and, and installed it. So 2013, like I said, a pump changes everything. I can use a timer, and I can put soaker, soaker hose in the garden, in the vegetable garden. So I can set the timer for five minutes and walk away. So I added a little splitter to the faucet. I put one leg out to the garden, and so every night we could water the garden. We just walk by, turn it to five minutes, and go inside and make dinner. Well, no, then we go to spend 20 minutes watering everything else. <laughs> but, but it started chipping away at the problem. And it meant that, like, we were in a hurry. The water was getting, and uh, the garden was getting water. The flowers out front were dying, but at least the garden was getting water every day because it was so cheap and easy to water. So, beginning of the year, end of the year. So we've added this pump. And that's about it. That's the big difference. How did it affect your water? Um, as in, did I have enough water? Yeah. Not a problem. Not even close. Um, I, I've got plenty of water. And the water usage is actually, I'm watering more things now and I'm using less water, but we'll get to that. So 2014, I don't have any pictures. It was a boring year. The timer broke, <laughs> replaced it. The, the picture you see, that was the new timer. And I ran a branch of hose to the second floor. So no more carrying the water upstairs. I just had a little stop you know, stop cock on the end of the hose. Uh, you're like a fixture that I could turn off and that turned out to be a little leaky. So then I added a little extra shut off valve at the end of the hose and I just sprayed. So now instead of hauling buckets upstairs, we had a ready infinite source essentially of water upstairs. So it only took about a minute or two to water all the tomatoes upstairs. The garden was watering itself. And so we were really starting to cut down. We cut about five or 10 minutes off of our watering time. So beginning of the year, end of the year, you can see here's the new faucet, so the old one, and then the new one. So now we've got rainwater upstairs, rainwater downstairs. 2015, I bought a raspberry, oh sorry, before I get to that. First off, I found out garden hoses don't hold up to continuous pressure. And we started getting leaks in random spots, I had to replace a couple of, uh, couple of fittings, uh, because the end of the hoses is, are usually the weakest, because that's where the the machine is stamped or, or formed uh, uh, a fitting onto it. Um, we were getting bubbling in various parts and we're still using a hose and there's some parts of the hose that are very recently soft. Um, and um, so um, when you think about it, if your rain barrel system is running with a pressurized line at the far end and a hose, you get a leak. That pump is more than happy to pump the entire contents of the rain barrels out. So keeping leaks down is a Big deal in rain girls. So uh, we learned that. Um, I bought an open sprinkler in a raspberry pot. And I drew up plans and how to hook it up, and I did nothing with it. Um, so this pie is actually a pretty old pie. I've been holding onto it for a long time and done nothing with it. But, uh, but you can see there's the board, and, and actually I'll, I'll just lift it up so you can see there's this green thing you can see the back of. And that's the board that kind of provides an interface between the 24 volt fixtures that the um, sprinkler systems use and the Raspberry Pi, so that in software you can say turn on this, uh, this fixture or turn on that fixture. Um, it also conveniently, when you plug in the 24 volt supply, it will down, uh, downstep that and feed that back into the Pi, so you don't need a power brick on the Pi either. So it's very nice setup. Um, this is open sprinkler. Super, super highly recommend them. Um, is a great, great, uh, great kit. Um, and it's fully open source. Um, so um, you can download, if you want to solder your own, you can totally do that. So beginning of the year, end of the year, no change. I, I added a couple of extra pots, because I think at some point we started adding additional pots. But otherwise, there's no change. This, um, um, this looks very similar to the, uh, to the previous year, um, and that, that was about it. So, 2016, um, similar to 2015, 
Didn't do much, uh, except I switched all of the places where I was using hose to like proper water line. It's this black stuff I've got here, um, which you guys won't be able to see, but you can feel. It's, you know, it's got about a millimeter of thickness and it's designed for continuous pressure. These are the things that they would run your water line under the yard for, for a sprinkler system, for example. Um, so very burly and cheap. It's like maybe 40 or $50 for 100 feet of it. So very inexpensive. Uh, but I didn't do anything other than that. I just switched the lines out so the system was more stable. So beginning of the year, end of the year, they look the same. So 2017, this is where things get exciting. Um, I added a water line to the front of the house. Because before, what we were doing was we were dragging the, water, the hose from the backyard all the way up to the street. And I literally crossed the street holding the garden hose because you need some extra length so when you come back to get the plants on the front porch, it can go around, down the sidewalk, up the front walkway, and onto the porch. So, you know, we'd hold the hose around the front, and we'd haul the hose around the back. Um, and the problem was uh, that we had a couple problems. One was we were hauling this hose. The other problem was that um, with that continuous pressure thing, um, we had been, it was very annoying to reach underneath the cabinet Right here, this is where the, behind this door is where the, the faucets were. Um, and so we often would leave the pressure on in the hose uh, because it was just a pain in the butt to turn it off. So, um, so once these hoses start breaking down, we start turning off the valves, but, um, but it was still inconvenient. So what I did was I relocated everything to a more convenient spot. So we have a garden hose that can get everything in the front yard and all of that stuff right there at the front. And we have another hose right in the backyard and it's outside. It's, you know, it's accessible. And, and this is a quarter turn ball valve. And if you're gonna get valves, get ball valves. They're, they're phenomenal. So, so much easier to open and shut. Um, and so this just made everything smooth. We didn't have to haul a hose up front. So now we pretty much have the maximal efficiency for watering with a garden hose. We could get rainwater in the backyard, we could get it in the front yard, we could get it on the second floor of our house. So that's pretty good. And so what, uh, what this looks like is you can see I have the faucet here and here before. Oh, this diagram. Oh, this is the wrong year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this diagram, uh, and you can see I added one there. And that was a big change from this year to this year. So now we had rainwater everywhere. So you ran, you ran uh, hoses, or, or rather the, these, these pipes? Yeah, I ran a from, pipe okay. down the ugly side of our house, behind <laughs> all of the all the plants in the front yard, okay. and right over here. Yeah. And so it's all out of sight. Um, and it's easy to get at, because I did get a leak right about here. Uh, I hadn't drained the line fully. In it. And these are not very flexible, so you, ha you have to have like... like uh, yeah, I did put a, a corner bend right okay. here. And then right here is our air conditioner, so I could just let the hose kind of take a wide turn because, well, it's the air conditioner, nobody okay. cares. So we are at 2018. I finally bought valves and wire to hook all this stuff up. <laughs> and I added a valve for the second floor, I added a valve for the vegetable garden, and I added a valve for the plants on the uh, back porch. Um, so these are zones in sprinkler speak. So each zone can be watered via an independent schedule and, and, and timing. And then after this presentation, this valve here isn't installed yet, but that'll be watering a, a garden we have along the side of our backyard. So you can see now I've added three valves and the fourth valve's over here. So this part now is going to go, quote, green. We've actually already planted stuff there. but. Okay, so why did I do all this? I uh, wanted to use rainwater. Um, you know, we're kind of granola eaters. Um, so, you know, we try to use rainwater. Um, and we also like saving money. They charge you for your rainwater. Um, so when you buy your water from the city, they charge you three ways. They charge you to give you the water. They assume you're going to give it back to them in the form of sewage. So they essentially double that number. And then they give you what's called a stormwater credit. And it's based off of kind of the, the um, anticipated runoff from your property. So if you've got a large, plot of, a large house on, on a piece of property, they're gonna assume that all that water volume is gonna be displaced into the storm sewers. 
If you've got a green lot, they won't charge you that much because they assume all that water is going to stay where it lands. Um, so when with the rain barrels, they will actually, you can file for it and they will refund your, your storm credit, uh, your storm charge. And so um, at this point, we are not technically no runoff. We're very close to it. In the winter, we definitely get some water that goes up to the street. But, um, but we're going to do a little bit of adjustment and we are effectively a net zero to the storm system. All of our property, all the water that lands is handled on the property, ignoring rounding errors. We do not direct anything out. Um, yeah, the stormwater credit also takes in, uh, uh, you can apply if you have large trees, mm -hmm. and it goes by, I think, the girth of the tree. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but don't, don't expect, I, I did this, and I have uh, uh, one, two, three, Four trees, four large trees, and I got something like two dollar fifty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so don't. <laughs> well, we might we might already be maxed out with the rain barrels anyhow. So, uh, you, you just apply for it. Uh, measure the trees. I mean, there is a. Um, they had a flyer that came in. Okay, this is Waterloo, not Kitchener. So, uh, I yeah, mean, maybe. No, no, I'll check. Yeah. I'll check. Yeah. So basically, I love saving two dollars and fifty cents a year. <laughs> you measure the girth, and then and then you tell them I have this much trees, and then. Uh, they also say rain barrels, buy rain barrels, so they multiply the rain barrel by whatever. Yeah. So you have six, I had one. So, uh, <laughs> no, I have seven. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, um, and yeah, it, and it's a significant credit. I forget how much it is, but it, it, is, uh, it is not a $2.50. I, I, I have no idea, but it, it's some number um, that I remember saying, oh, okay, that's nice. Hmm. Um, so it's way less effort to water, even with a garden hose. Um, um, you know, it still takes a while to water everything. You got to go around, and if you're too much of a rush, then you know you only sprinkle it. You don't actually water it deep, right? Um, so um, adding the the valves, the zoning, the open sprinkler system allows me to drip irrigate and to drip irrigate um, uh, with you know. Yeah, like uh, when the sun sets, it'll it'll drip irrigate itself. I don't even have to think about it. Um, the watering is way more regular, right? It waters every day if it needs to, um, and it's weather responsive. Like I said, if it needs to, so it'll look at the weather report and it will create a kind of a, a, a fudge factor. It'll say, "Oh, it was a hot, sunny day, and the humidity is low." I'm going to multiply by 150% all of the watering times. Or it was a cool day, I'm actually gonna turn off the watering. Uh, we, the, there wasn't a significant amount of evaporation today. Um, your, your plant should be fine. And, and we, I've seen it go back and forth, over 100% and like 2% or something like that below. And you can do this on a zone by zone basis. So you can say, follow the, um, follow the weather report on this zone and don't follow the weather report on that zone. Um, so maybe you hook it up to your plants inside. Um, the, um, oh, different watering for each zone, like I said. Uh, and it was fun to do. It was, a, it was a fun project. And it makes my wife's life a lot easier. I'm very much the infrastructure of gardening. Move the dirt around, put the wood in place. And she does a lot more of the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, picking, harvesting stuff. Like, I'll grow the stuff and then I won't even harvest it. So, um, so... Um, you know, it makes, uh, it makes both of our lives a lot easier. Um, so what worked well, spend money on a pump. By the way, I didn't tell you how much this cost. Um, I saw something that does this sort of thing for as cheap as 120 bucks, and it looked reasonably okay. But this unit cost me about 150, 160 dollars. And then there's some, you know, parts and so forth. Um, and I think it's a good deal. Um, it's a good quality pump, it's worked well. I had to get some replacement parts on it. Um, and I found them easy to get. Um, so, yay for the pump. Um, for the valves that I'm using, and I'll talk a little more about uh, the open sprinkler setup, but just for the slides here. This is one of the valves, this is another valve. You'll notice they don't look alike. This is a commercial valve, this is a residential valve. And you'll see I have another valve here. And that's because I want to trim the pressure so I don't blow fixtures off the ends of things. Uh, with the drip irrigation, if you have too much pressure, it'll blow parts off. Um, and, and in fact, this hose blew off it a couple occasions. Um, so um, this has an extra little handle up there, and that allows you to trim the water pressure. And so you can tune the water pressure for each zone 
So if you, if you want a lot of pressure in a zone and a lot of flow rate, um, you can jack it up. And this is only like another five or maybe $10. And that's actually turns out to be a lot cheaper than buying all the fixtures and adapters to add this valve over here. And it makes for a smaller, more compact unit. Um, and the unit is just more robust. So I highly recommend getting the commercial ones. Um, they have a larger bore inside them. Um, so they take a one inch pipe rather than a three quarter inch pipe. Um, and all of my piping is one half inch. So I always have to do a half inch to a three quarter inch or to a full inch adapter. But with these, um, so I bought this valve off Irrigation Direct. They have little bushings you can put on each side that just stops it down. So it's like three bucks per valve to adapt to your system. And then that's it. You've got all the features in this kit, a really robust valve. And for a little bit of cash, you don't have to buy any other accessories. Um, so, um, so definitely go with the, you know, the quote, commercial valves. Um, they are better. Um, what worked, um, so I bought a, um, a kit for drip irrigation, and it comes with, you know, a bunch of bits and bobbles and one of everything, and um, in the kit, it comes with actually that many, four of these little valves, and a, about a dozen, a, several dozen of other valves. These valves are awesome, so I have, um, you know, I have an example of, you know, this is kind of one valve, and then this is the other one. And this one puts out about two gallons a minute at their you know, established pressure. But these, um, these are tunable. Um, you can screw the cap back and forth so you can set the pressure uh, or the, the flow rate on them. And um, they're very easy to put in place. You just stick them, right? They have a stick on them. Uh, you don't need to deal with uh, other things that don't have sticks on them. Um, and the cool thing about this, you can see this uh, valve has a little spray pattern. And as you adjust it, it gets wider or, wider or narrower. So if you put it in a pot, you can dial it way down for a small pot, and you can open it up for a big pot. Um, so you can control the area each valve individually is covering. And that flexibility really helps uh, a lot. Um, I found it very useful um, because um, the, the, other valve, the, the other emitters, they drip just in one spot. So you get a bunch of watering right there, but most of the area, like just three or four inches away, is bone dry. And so this, this really just does a better job of watering, in my opinion. Um, and these are, they include four of them in the kit, and they're teasers. They charge, I think, like $8 for four or something. And so if you do your whole system, this is going to be a lot of these that you're buying. Uh, if you go to Amazon and you are willing to wait a couple weeks, you can get 50 of them for 20 bucks, and they work great. These are those 50. Um, so just order them online, wait. Um, they're very good. Um, open Sprinkler, which I have not talked about much, but I'm about to dive into, has worked phenomenally. Um, it just works. I'm trying to think of something I want, and I'm having a hard time finding it. Um, and when I say that, I mean, I've got everything I, I want. It just works. It's simple. It was easy to set up. It, it'll only take a couple minutes, and it does it. Uh, it's got a, uh, iOS is what I use. The iOS app works well, it does crash on occasion, but not often enough to be a problem. We can control things with it. You can register it online, so you could do it on the internet. I don't. Um, and you can hook it up to if this, then that, and other things. Um, and there is an Android app as well. And the interface on um, the apps are pretty much identical to the web interface. So I'm not going to show you the app interface. Uh, the web interface really does look exactly like the mobile app. Uh, but it, it has worked great. Uh, what not to do? Um, don't use a garden hose for constant pressure. Don't use valves without pressure regulators because they're just, it's more expensive. I've spent a fortune on, um, on parts to, adapt, to add pressure regulation. I standardize, just buy like five of the same valve because I had to buy a lot of adapters from this hose up to that valve size, down from that valve size to that valve size, <laughs> and then from a different valve, a different set of of adapters and so forth, and it's just been expensive. Uh, and I should have run seven strand wires, so three of my valves are kind of in line with each other. So I ended up running three different, uh, two, uh, two pair of wire lines out to those points, rather than one seven strand line, and then you know just splicing in along the way. And so it's just kind of annoying. 
What to watch out for? If you're using a pressurized system, the leak is a big problem uh, with rain barrels. If you're using the garden hose, a drip, drip, drip leak might not be too big of a concern. But with a rain barrel, it is a big concern. So you really need to get those uh, fittings sealed well. And don't forget to address mosquitoes. Um, if you've got these standing water barrels, um, you need to put a bit of screening over all the openings to keep them out. So let's get into the demo. So, um, let me clear. So, unfortunately, I can't get the Raspberry Pi and me online at the same time. Mm. So the Pi is just hooked up to me. I'm gonna interact with it, but it's not gonna be able to go out and pull down weather data, so I'm not gonna be able to do the full demonstration. But, uh, but I, I did um, do something sensible enough, which is that I uh, downloaded the code ahead of time. So if you go to the, um, the page, it has, oh, yeah, here is the setup directions. Get clone the code. Oh, crap. Uh, get clone the code, go in the directory, hit build, and it sudo build, and it just kind of works. So that's what I'm going to do. So here is my directory, and let me just make sure I'm not running it anymore. Yep. So I have downloaded Open Sprinkler, and there it is. Um, so this was just a Git clone that I did previously. Um, the uh, I think it just uses the standard build essential tools if you're a uh, Debian-based distro. Um, so it just uses make and C. It's uh, C code mostly. Um, and um, he has done a phenomenal job. You just type sudo build and then uh, open sprinkler pi. And so this comes in a bunch of variants. So this is called the unified firmware. He makes a, um, oh, uh, not Ardu yeah, Arduino-based system. Um, this produces the firmware for that. You can also get a version that runs on a Beagle. This produces the firmware for that. So that's why you, you have to give it the build variant it's going to be producing. And it takes, I think, seven seconds when I last timed it. So it's going to ask me if I want to install the service. No, it isn't. OK, let me double check that it's, uh, the service might have already been installed. Okay. <coughs> service, open sprinkler. OK, so I fired it up. And um, it, I unfortunately didn't clean my system out. So it will ask you, do you want me to install the startup script? Yes, install the startup script. So it's now running, and so by default, uh, it will listen on, let's see, yeah. Um, so let me just get the uh, 11.103. So by default, it's going to listen on port 8080. So I'm going to type 8080. Hmm. That is odd. Let's go ahead and stop <coughs> Open Sprinkler. Now I'll just go ahead and remove it. Let's see, backups. Yeah, okay. So remove, of course, Open Sprinkler Gen 2. Update RC. Remove. Let's try this again. <laughs> um, so I'm going to git clone, as in I'm going to go to my backup, and copy it here. So this is a fresh install. Let me just double check. Yep, no. OK. And then sudo build open sprinkler pot. So now this project is 
not the best organized. If you're a developer, I would be a little embarrassed. Like there isn't a configuration directory or, you know, kind of clear structures around logging and things like that. It's just sort of dumped in one spot. So when the service starts up, it just kind of dumps files in the same directory where the source code is. There isn't a build target directory. Um, it's, it is a little amateurish in its assembly, but frankly, it works well enough by default. I don't care. Um, but you could find it a little, little messy to work with, and, and I wouldn't fault you for it. So let's see. There it goes. So Open Sprinkler has set up. Now, I don't know why I'm logged in by default. Uh, probably because I have the default kind of login token. Um, but uh, by default, it'll ask you for a password. And by default, it is open door. Um, and so um, here it is. And you can see this says, hey, given my weather data, and all of the tuning you've configured, I'm gonna to plan to water 100% at the next interval. So this is, that number will go up and down during, during the days um, as the weather data comes in and it can kind of tune what watering it does. Um, so the uh, first thing I would recommend you do is change your password. But then after that, um, you go over here to edit options and um, you can change your time zone and your location. I'm not online, so I can't do that. But um, you can set Kitchener, and so or, or Waterloo if you're Waterloo. And so now it'll pull weather data uh, from your local location. And then um, you can go here. And so I haven't had a chance to play around with this quite yet, but uh, er, I haven't had a chance to fully play around with this quite yet. But um, there is, oh, sorry, up here, Fear Master Station Handling, where is it? Um, integrations. There it is. So if you have a Weather Underground API key, you can use it here to get your weather data from Weather Underground. There's also a site called Open Weather Map. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is just a couple months ago, um, the uh, Weather Underground was purchased and they closed their API. Um, that does, what that means is if you have an existing API key, you can continue to use it, but they weren't issuing new free API keys for people. The lowest tier is $850 a month. Wow. Um, so you can't even make one call an hour or something like that for free. Um, but Open Weather Map apparently is a little better than that. I just haven't tested them out. But if you don't put anything in here, it'll use the Open Weather Map system. If you do put something in here, it uses the, um, uh, the weather information provided by Weather Underground. And that's, that's what I'm using. Um, there's a bunch of other things that um, you can do here. For example, you can change the default port, which I did. I switched over to 80 on my machine, but save you guys the time because you have to restart. Um, and then over here, you can say, Okay, what do I do with it? And so there's two basic algorithms that come out of the box. Zimmerman is based off of rain, rain or, or uh, precipitation totals, temperature, and humidity. And it will create a score that adjusts up and down. The auto rain delay, every time it rains, push it forward. You push the next watering forward by X amount. Um, there's also some um, ability to deal with regulations. So California has some wonky regulations. So there's a setting for that if you live in California, like we all do. Um, and you can also hook up all sorts of random sensors. So you can uh, hook up a sensor that measures the flow rate of the various uh, um, the water coming in and out. Uh, you can go ahead and put in a rain sensor um, and you can like control an outlet and things like that. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways uh, you can integrate with things. Also, you can integrate with if this, then that. Um, but I'm just gonna go with the basic station uh, configuration for now, because you know I wanna kind of give a demonstration. Um, so no, I'm not gonna save any changes. So these are eight stations, and that is what this system supports out of the box. There are eight connectors here. Um, and then there's an extension pin 
uh, board on the end. So you can actually, I think the maximum is 56 individual stations if you add expansion boards. Um, again, open source, you can, you can find the designs for these things. Um, but for now, we're going to go ahead and just stick with the 8. And so you can go over here, you can give it a name. Uh, front air, let's see, um, second floor, I think, was the first one I made. And you can do some, you can configure a few things. Uh, sequential just says don't turn on all the valves at once. Do them one after another, so if they're all scheduled for the same time, uh, it'll, it'll sequence them out so you don't, uh, you don't draw down too much pressure at once. Um, you can even add a little photo here if you want. And then, um, since I believe I have it hooked up, no, I actually don't have the, um, both leads hooked up. Give me a second. Let me hook up the other lead. Pulled out for some reason. So these are just screw-on terminals, and you can use just about any any wire to do this um, because the wiring is going outside and underneath some stuff. I used fairly burly wire because I just didn't want to have to worry about it um, getting nicked or anything like that. But you can go ahead and now you can go over here and say turn on this valve. And you can hear the bell activating. It sounds kind of loud, but when it's outside, you don't notice it. The birds are really noisy. <laughs> um, so, so I have one that's actually a lot louder than this. The commercial bell is very loud, but I can I can't hear it. Like the scene of the water and things like that, it, it just doesn't matter. Okay, so we now got valves. We can turn them on. There's rainwater coming out of them. I hear the pump firing up. But how do we make this automated? So we can go over here and we can go ahead and edit the programs. So I'm going to add a program. I'm going to say water tomatoes. And I'm going to enable it. I'm going to use weather adjustment. So it's automatically going to apply that Zimmerman algorithm with the weather data it's got. Um, and the start time. So um, I set it for sunset. And the reason why I do that is, is if you water in the morning, the sun burns off that, some of that water, it evaporates. It has, doesn't have a chance to soak in. If you water at night, um, the water has plenty of time to soak in. You don't want to water your lawn at night because grass is kind of sensitive to being wet overnight and it can get molds and funguses that grow on it. But for like potted plants, you're pouring the water directly on the soil with like a drip irrigation uh, fixtures. Um, not a problem at all. And so I just water at sunset every day. And then um, you can choose days of the week. You can choose you know, intervals, um, odd days, even days. So we're all familiar with this. So if you live in uh, the KW area, there's water restrictions in the summer, you're going to need to select one of these. I'm using rainwater, so I water every day. Um, but, uh, but if you don't use rainwater, then you might need to select some of these options. And so I would say for these tomatoes, they need three minutes um, between sunset and sunrise. Or no, no, sorry, three minutes. Uh, yeah. No, did I do that right? Yeah. Pardon the uh, demo issue. Uh, programs. Programs. Yeah, okay. Second floor tomatoes. Um, use weather adjustment. Uh, second floor three minutes. Submit. And so now, um, once I hit submit here, days of the week. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, I've only set this system up at home once, so uh, needless to say, I, uh, I, I forgot the details. Okay, so now every day in sunset, because this program is using, um, uh, let's see, where is the setting that I have? Uh, somewhere in here, the setting is saying 
sunset um, kick off the program, it'll say, if I need water, run it for X amount of time. And it'll turn the valve on and off. Uh, and that's about it. I mean, that's all it does. Um, you can add a bunch of other things. You can go ahead and have um, various fixtures, measure things and whatnot. Um, you can have it turn on the pump, then turn on the valve, and then turn off the valve and then turn off the pump. Uh, so there is sequencing available in here. I just haven't needed that because I have a uh, you know, functional pump. And that's about uh, it for the software. So I'll just talk a little bit about the fixtures. So here's a, a valve. This is called the solenoid. Um, and the solenoid, if you unscrew it a little bit, turns on the water so you can test the system and then you can just tighten it back down. It turns it off until it's activated. Um, and then I have a valve here for trimming the uh, pressure. And I have a couple emitters. So I have just like a standard drip emitter and I have a, a bubbler, as they call it, uh, which does an area. So you guys can go ahead and look at it and touch it uh, and see what this looks like in person. I also want to point out um, the connections. So the water tightness of the connections is super important. And I happen to have PEX plumbing at my house. Uh, I did a bunch of PEX work. And so I bought a PEX clamping kind of tool thing. And I use what are called pinch clamps, which are what you do when you're cheap. And uh, I have these cost like 20 bucks for 50 or something. And these cost $1.50 each. I have a lot of connections. So I just use my PEX kit to do them all. And it, it worked well. I had to wrap a little electrical tape on, on the joints to thicken the hose up just a little bit to meet the spec. Um, but once I did that, um, they, they hold just fine. But if you're just doing small parts of the system, you can use what are called band clamps. They're just going to be more expensive per piece. So you'll, you'll really, re, really be conscious of how many connections you're making. Uh, there are also other connectors like pinch clamps. There are push connectors and so forth. And I think I'm at time. Um, so any questions? Yeah. Uh, what do you do for wintering the system? I mean, do you drain it or? Yeah, I drain everything. You got to get all the water out of the system. Um, the next part I'm going to be installing is actually a low point in the system. Deliberately, it'll be set up so that the water, it, that's the exit point for the entire system. So I'll walk the line out. Uh, upstairs, the line will drain automatically. For the downstairs, I'll have to walk the line out to um, towards this low point. And the other direction, I'll walk it out towards another discharge valve I have. Um, and uh, normally what people do is they use compressed air. They put fresh air to one of their fixtures, and they blow the water out to the rest of the system. Any, uh, any merit to putting uh, ground moisture sensors into the system to, to track that kind of stuff? I have thought about that. It's pretty well functioning already, and the question is where to put the sensors. So the big, um, yes, there is a merit to it, but the weather algorithm works well. Um, the, uh, the other question is where are you going to put it? So for example, we have you know, 15 potted plants. And some of them are a little drier than the other ones, and I think that you're probably better off figuring out how to tune the emitters to each other to get everything watering at a relatively even cadence than, um, than working with a moisture sensor. You might want to get a handheld one just to, to calibrate the system, but I haven't been particularly excited or interested in doing that now that I've got the system off. It just didn't seem like it was going to add any value. Anybody else have questions? I was wondering how you balance the uh, pressure. Uh, I kind of like in my mind, I was picturing uh, the upstairs being a little bit harder to deliver. Well, it's like, its own it just zone, like... so I can run those valves. Long. Okay. Um, and I, I don't run them particularly long. I have actually lower restriction emitters up there, so it's just essentially an open pipe, and and so the tomatoes just get, and then they're done. They, they get like a minute of watering, it just pours in, it cuts a little divot in the dirt, and then it turns off. The other ones are a lot more elegant. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, it, it really, the, 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 the calculator you can put on it, it turning off and on, it's much happier to be on for a long time or off for a long time. So you definitely want to make sure you put enough workload on the end of those, uh, on the end of the lines if you're going to be using a pump. You want to make sure that you have, you know, at least 10 or 15 fixtures so the pump will have continuous uh, watering to do. Otherwise, it'll pressurize the line, the 
poses will stretch out, and then it'll turn off, and then it'll turn back on like two seconds later. So given that issue, do you uh, do you tend to kind of like stage them so like one zone will turn on as the other one is kind of turning off? So, so it's, it's like auto st lot. staging. So if you yeah. go over here and you go to the programs, um, no, I don't want to save any changes. Over here, uh, no, no, that's not where I was going. Um, let's see, where is the uh, heating? I forget what the setting is. Um, option. I should probably, though, um, uh, give up the uh, the floor. <laughs> um, but there is a setting for that. Uh, I was I flew sure. by it uh, at That's previous fine. point. But it, it'll it'll uh, limit to one. Um, oh yeah, it's on the it's on the station itself. So if you go over here, uh, it, that sequential is what it does. Hmm. And then there's. You know, station type. You can you can use different types of things: radio controlled stations, uh, web server controlled stations. Um, but the sequential is, is what it does. Uh, does that? Cool. Well, feel free to handle the hardware. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, so we'll take about like a five-minute break, and we'll get Benjamin set up, and then we'll start again.